Hey, this is Joe Hubbard, and welcome to Advanced Bass. This particular lesson is on how to use melodic quotes in your soloing. So with that in mind, grab your bass and let's get started. The usage of melodic quotation has been around since the beginning of jazz and is very effective, especially in a modern context. Melodic quotation is based on interweaving melodies or fragments of those melodies and then superimposing them over a tune you're playing over. Melodic quotes can be used at any point of a tune, but often are heard over the one chord or two five variations leading back to the one chord. The concept of quoting melodies is very useful over song forms such as the blues and gives you a platform on which you can pull your listener in for a quick hot minute with something recognizable. This can prove to be an effective launching pad into other ideas and work to break up different concepts within your current vocabulary. In this lesson, I've written a blues etude using two melodies from two different jazz standards. Check this out. At the end of the first chorus, I'm quoting a famous Sonny Rollins tune called Olio. Olio is a rhythm changes tune, but the melody works nicely over the last four bars of the blues. So let's take a deeper look at what I'm doing here. The first four bars is all based on a B flat seven. So what we're doing here is playing a combination of approach note patterns uh, along with chord tones, and it goes like this. <laughs> Then when it makes the change into the E flat, what I'm playing is a rhythmic phrase, and I'm kind of setting up this oleo uh, phrase at the last four bars with this sort of polyrhythmic phrase that we have here. Now, the thing is, is in a five or ten minute video, you're not going to learn the depth that you need to learn when we're talking about things like polyrhythms, or for that matter, really getting deep into chord tones and chromatic approach note patterns. We're just not going to do it. But if you get over to my website, joehubbardbassvideos.com, I have in-depth programs which discusses and covers all of these things. Of course, these things last for a period of years, and you know that's where you're going to really get this under your belt and really sort of solidify this material. So if we look at this second four bars, what I'm doing is I'm taking a pattern of three beats and I'm just displacing it through the, the different places of the bar. So um, we've got this first phrase, which is a quarter note, two eighth notes tied to a quarter. That's worth three beats. And if you get your PDF uh, uh, worksheet and follow along with me, you can see the next phrase starts on beat four. So I've got quarter note, two eighths tied to uh, an eighth, uh, qu another quarter note there. And then there's a quarter rest, and that equates to the first two bars. So it goes like this, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, it's good to count along with these things so you can really learn how to feel that and slow that down. Um, and then notice in the next two bars, we're just kind of taking a similar phrase, but we're just displacing it again by an eighth note. So I've got this where I'm going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. When it leads into the melodic quote, which is in the last four bars, this is taken from the Sonny Rollins tune, which is kind of a, uh, has a notorious reputation of being very tricky rhythmically. And it's really just employing these same sort of polyrhythmic figures that are going across the beats that make it a bit complicated. So if we take a look at this and also how this kind of fits nicely over this 2-5 
that's taking us back to the B flat seven. Now, note that when you use melodic quotes, one of the real techniques to employ or start to employ is the technique of paraphrasing. I might not take the exact melody and notice how I've sort of really started to um, mess with it in the sort of last two bars. Uh, really the last kind of two beats uh, of the third bar and then the going into the fourth bar to then set it up for the next chorus. Uh, so, you know, that's okay. You know, be creative with this stuff. And, you know, you don't have to play it note for note. But it's just giving the listener that idea that, you know, yeah, that tune has come up. And the other cool thing is, is that if you think of your phrasing and you specifically think of your phrasing rhythmically, this is very important when you're sort of playing and improvising, is that a lot of times people just start to play the same sort of rhythmic flow. And that's okay to do, but it's really nice to break that up with some sort of polyrhythmic ideas that make your lines more interesting. And you can learn a lot from just learning bebop heads. So in this specific case, I suggest that you go take the tune Olio, which is a rhythm changes tune by Sonny Rollins, and learn the whole head. But for this, what we're just going to do is just take this little bit that's going to take us through the last four bars. So I've got this. <laughs> And that's the whole four bars. And note how the tricky things is when you look at that second bar, the last, the, the two notes on beat four, it, they kind of sound odd, like that should be somewhere else. And that's where you're really starting to get this polyrhythmic flavor that's kind of running through this etude, okay? So get this down, and then we're going to come back and do the second chorus. Okay, so what I want you to do is spend some time thinking about how these ideas are working over the changes and how effective this melodic quote sounds over the 2-5-1 leading us back to the top. In the next chorus, I'm starting the melodic quote by piggybacking from the oleo melody into the first four bars of Charlie Parker's Confirmation. This works nicely over this section and gives me a great launching pad into some cool bebop ideas. So taking a look at the first four bars of this second chorus, what I'm doing is I'm taking the Charlie Parker tune called Confirmation, and then I'm superimposing that over the first four bars of this blues, which works perfectly. You can note that as it kind of gets into that last bar, I'm kind of changing it. And again, this leads us back into this concept of paraphrasing the melodic quote. Uh, you know, you're kind of, uh, you know, saying it as though, uh, you know, you're putting your kind of spin on it. And I think that this is very important when you're interweaving these melodic quotes, especially to not make them end up sounding corny and too pre-planned. So um, it's, it's kind of cool to practice this in this way. And of course, writing etudes is always a great way to inculcate this material on a different level. So if we take a look at th this first uh, four bars I've got. And then I'm moving into that next four bars. So the deal is there is that um, notice that I've kept the flavor of the whole first four bars of confirmation, but that last bar I've changed the, the notes around a little bit to lead me into that four chord. And one, one of the things that I've done here as well is use octave displacement. So... <laughs> So jumping up there, using a little bit of octave displacement, which is another cool tactic to use across the board when you know, you're know you putting any lines together over chord changes. So if we take a look at the next four bars of the second chorus, this leads us into the E flat seven. And what I'm doing here is I'm superimposing a B flat minor major seven 
over the E flat 7. I've got this. And that's a nice kind of idea because as I talk about in my book, 50 Essential Jazz Funk Lines, is that these minor shapes kind of work better on the fretboard than the sort of dominant shapes. Not to say that's the only thing I use, but I do use this concept quite a bit and I find it very useful because it's really sort of uh, works well with the instrument. So that's kind of a cool thing that uh, is going on there. And then on the next two bars, I'm using a little bit of tritone substitution. Instead of going to that 6-7 chord, which would be the G7, I'm playing like a 2-5 starting on the D minor 7 and then taking it down to a D flat uh, dominant 7th chord which is going to move by half step into the 2 chord, which is a C minor 7 chord. And I'm playing this. And that's a nice pattern there that takes you chromatically down. And I really recommend you practicing these patterns moving chromatically, either descending or ascending. Uh, very useful when getting around these type of changes. Uh, going into the last line, where basically I'm using kind of a pedal thing, you know, over the, the C minor 7. I mean, sometimes, you know, this idea of never playing a root on a solo kind of comes up with bass players because we play so many roots. But you know what? You don't want to forget about the roots, even on your solo. And I've noticed this from transcribing hundreds of different solos from horn players of just how many of those horn players often play the roots, you know, within their lines. So it's something that you don't want to just like, you know, bass players do have a problem with this because they can tend to have that root karma going on. So when they start playing solos, they never play anything but the root. But don't forget about the root because the root can be an important thing even in your solo. So there I'm kind of pedaling on this vibe here. And then going into this, um, the, the five chord and doing kind of a, a, an augmented kind of scale thing. Running up into this turnaround. Now, look at the turnaround here. We've got B flat. Uh, the essential uh, parent chords here is just the B flat 7, then moving in that last bar to an F7. But what I've done here is use this kind of diminished 2 5 substitution concept, which I'd be remiss not to mention my book, Functional Harmonic Concepts, because all of this material is in this book uh, where you can use these sort of uh, minor third substitutions. And if you look at a tune like Teen Town, that's really based on those dominant minor third substitutions as well. But how useful they are here, I've just taken the B flat seven and gone B flat seven in the first two beats. The second two beats is a G seven sharp nine. Then the next two beats is a A flat dominant seven. And then the next two beats is an F7. So the line is here. It's kind of a cool line. And then I end it off on the root there, go to the five to the root. And then the little chord voicing I'm playing on the top is a B flat 13 chord. So I've got the 13, which is the G. I've got the third of the chord, which is the D, and I've got flat seven, which is A flat. And that's a nice sort of sound, really modern type of sound. So what I want you to do is go through this, learn this, see how cool these melodic quotes are being used and how it kind of lifts it and gives it a different twist rhythmically. Um, all these things are really cool to study. And then once you get this down in this key, learn it in all the other keys. And I guarantee you, if you just learn it in three keys, it'll turbocharge your skills into another dimension. But just work on doing this. Start working these ideas in different keys. Okay, now you go practice. You know, knowledge is power, and it still amazes me how so many people try to put a time limit on their learning evolution.
You need to become comfortable in understanding that learning should be an ongoing process. I often find myself quoting the famous American playwright Eugene O'Neill, who once said, success is a stale finale. The struggle is the success. So just to validate that quote, the struggle equates to the learning process, which should be an ongoing evolution. So make sure that you check out all of my online courses over at joehubbardbasedvideos.com. I also have a very comprehensive book library at joehubbardbase.com, which covers subjects like walking bass lines, sight reading, jazz improvisation, and functional harmony. So what are you waiting for? Until next time, practice smart, work hard, and play creatively. Thank <laughs> you.